Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Marsha Mott, the Health Promotions Coordinator for UF Health. Thank you for joining us tonight as we learn about the healthy way to run from the experts in running at UF Health. Dr. Heather Vincent is one of our speakers. She's the Director of Body Composition, Metabolism, Exercise Physiology, and Programming at the UF Health Sports Performance Center. She's a fellow in the American College of Sports Medicine and completed her doctorate in exercise physiology at the University of Florida. She also completed her NIH NCCAM postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Virginia. She has more than 15 years of experience with resistance and aerobic exercise adaptations, body composition in health and disease, nutrition and weight management for, nutrition and weight management for individuals of all ages. She's currently a research faculty member in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation and has published numerous articles on exercise, nutrition, and body composition. We also have tonight Dr. Kevin Vincent. He's the director of the Running Medicine Clinic and the founding chair of the UF Health Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He received his PhD in exercise physiology and his MD from the University of Florida. He completed his residency training in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Virginia. Dr. Vincent's clinical interests include running medicine, sports medicine, and muscle, musculoskeletal medicine with a particular emphasis on running, overuse energy, and participation in strength training. <clears throat> Dr. Vincent lectures at conferences nationwide on running medicine and running-related injuries. Dr. Vincent is also the medical director for the UF Health Sports Performance Center and is active in research and running-related research. The Vincents have both been in the front runners of running medicine at UF Health for 15 years. If you have questions for us tonight, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We have a large audience today, and I know there's going to be a lot of great questions. We're going to do our best to answer as many as we can. As we begin tonight, I thought it would be interesting for us to learn a little bit about each of you. I'm going to put a poll up on the screen, so please take a minute to let, every, to let us know how long you've been running and what type of a runner you are. Thank you so much for attending tonight. Dr. Vincent, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Marcia. Uh, Dr. Heather, in a second, we'll have the screen come up or the, our um, title screen. What I just want to do is cover for a minute a little bit of what we're doing here and, and what our purpose is for this talk. And the basic premise about running and what I see a lot in clinic are if you are going to run after somebody to catch up to them or if you're going to run to catch a bus, everybody knows how to do that. But running for exercise is different. You're going to do 850 to 1,000 footfalls per foot per mile. And if there's any perturbation in gait or issues with your training program, then what you're going to notice is that can lead to, to injury, to lack of, of proper performance. And so it's really understanding what goes into running and running healthy. And this is whether you're a new runner or an experienced runner who's then looking to go from running five and 10 Ks to half marathons or full marathons. Every type of transition that you make could be from trails to on the road or vice versa. Different shoes can affect how your body absorbs force and interacts with the ground. So what we wanted to do tonight is to cover the idea of what does it take to start a program, to be part of a running program, and then to run healthy. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Heather in a minute. Uh, on the first slide, you'll notice the two of us, like, like uh, Marcia said, I'm the director of the UF Running Medicine Clinic uh, and the founding chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Looks like most people are casual runners that have been running for, for 10 or more years, so outstanding. Uh, Dr. Heather is our research director in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and really had, runs the lab in the Sport Performance Center. So we're hoping to give you a flavor for what we do and how what we're doing is translating into helping people with healthy running and healthy running form. Uh, Heather, Dr. Heather, next slide, please. A lot of times we call ourselves uh, Dr. Heather and Dr. Kevin because we have the same last name. So uh, pardon me if I flip back and forth. From a disclosures perspective, we're both associate editors for Medicine, Science, Sports, and Exercise, which is the official journal of the American College of Sports Medicine. And Dr. Heather has research funding from Lalamand Health Solutions and Children's Miracle Network. So with this, I'm going to turn over to uh, Dr. Heather to go to introduce the goals of the program, and then we're going to sort of be tag teaming the presentation as we go forward. So I want to welcome everybody to the session. I hope you really enjoy it. Ask questions. We're going to leave plenty of time at the end to answer and go through questions and really hope that we're bringing to this session what you're looking to get out of it. So thank you very much for spending time with us. 
I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Heather. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Marsha and Gabby, for helping to set this up so that we have the privilege of interfacing with all of you today. We have three main things that we would really like to accomplish with you in this very short time, with which what we hope is the first of many talks with you. And the first is to share the high hitting latest research on safe running mechanics. What are the numbers actually showing and what can we learn from it? Two, what are main injury prevention strategies that you can start implementing even today? Uh, as you go home and think about your programs, we wanna give you some hard hitting, high efficient information to use. And then lastly, share some considerations about a healthy running shoe as well as developing a strong foot. So when we put these goals together, we hope to arm you tonight with important information that you can implement starting today. <clears throat> so let's jump right into mechanics. And so one of the phrases that Dr. Kevin has coined is that we think about running as thousands of single-legged squats in a row. So for every accumulated amount of distance, every time you take a step, the running motion is actually a single-legged squat. And so when we think about success and longevity of running, this is really dependent on the ability to maintain excellent form of that single-legged squat over time. And then secondly, the good mechanics really have to be supported by a strong system. The, the mechanics can't function without a strong musculoskeletal system to support it, to keep the cumulative loading from running safe and low stress on your body. Yeah, I will and say so, that uh, one, one of the things that I usually tell people is uh, not only is this series of single leg squats, but I have people demonstrate it like Dr. Heather will show, because your ability when you're running, it's all about dissipating force. And your body expects the forces to go through your legs and through your body in a very symmetric and expected way. So these alterations that might come from weakness on one side or tightness on one side or any asymmetry is going to lead to overstress and your inability to dissipate force. So that principle of the single leg squats and the symmetry of loading is really what carries through healthy running and, and ability to do running without getting injured or to, to minimize the risk of injury. So. Sorry, Dr. Heather, I was just throwing that one piece in. And, and this is important because when we look at runners together, whether it's in the clinic or in the lab space in the sports performance center, it's critical that the motion on the left side, that's good form, is equal to the motion on the right side. And that symmetry is really a main key tonight that we want to leave you with about protecting your musculoskeletal tissues. And so part of what we do is we look at the factors that affect your symmetry. So when we think about in each of you who are sitting here tonight listening, maybe you have one or more of these issues that you're trying to deal with as you're working through your mechanics. Potentially leg length discrepancies exist. Maybe you have one leg that's longer than the other, whether it's anatomically longer or functionally longer based on tightness in certain areas or positioning of your pelvis. Maybe that's something that's going on. Potentially there are strength deficiencies on both legs or one leg or one side, or maybe there's strength deficiencies in the core or the lumbar area or the feet that need to be addressed. Those change symmetry. Acute fatigue. We know that when we go for a tiring run, by the end of the run, the mechanics are probably not the same as they were when you started. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Also previous injury history or surgery may have changed mechanically some specific areas of your kinetic chain and make it more challenging for you to keep the same motion on the left as the right. And then finally, maybe some of you have different sports or activities that you played or still play today. For example, we see a lot of uh, runners that come in with the history of playing soccer. We've had pole vaulters. We've also had throwers of different types come in and be assessed for running. And we find asymmetries because they're used to loading primarily on one side or the other. So those are factors we look at as we compare symmetry from one side to the other. And this is important because when we think about session after session after session of loading, if we don't address symmetry correctly the first time and the first bout of running, this could eventually lead to breakdown. And so let's consider that even if you just went out tonight and did one acute bout of running, what does that do to your body? And there's some pretty incredible things that happen. If we look at the level of the knee, the mechanical pounding on the knee can actually deform and change the thickness of your cartilage as well as your meniscus of your knee. 
In addition, one bout of running can also increase the loading on the IT band, can really stress the Achilles tendon, put forces on the joints, and change the stiffness of the plantar fascia of the foot. So imagine now if the mechanics are not symmetrical and you're loading your body during running, we can see how this might contribute to injury. In addition, fatigue worsens these issues because it makes it challenging for you to control when you impact the ground. Fatigue makes it very difficult for you to control the loading and potentially maybe some of you recognize when your footfalls become louder progressively over a tiring run or you hear the person next to you if you're uh, racing or you're running in a group, maybe you hear somebody who's loud. That is worsened with fatigue and that means the impact is getting harder and harder and harder. In addition, foot pronation with loading starts to worsen with fatigue, which is also not a good sign. Patellofemoral stress goes up and the alignment of the hip through the ankle becomes much more challenged with fatigue. So recognizing when fatigue is turning to set in is really important to take a break. So what does fatigue look like? I thought this was a perfect example of, we see the exhausted runners coming across the finish line. Maybe you feel that way after a five mile run, 10 mile run, or for those who are just starting, before you allow the fatigue to change your mechanics to this point, where we see pelvic drop, knee drop, this lean to the side, trunk rotation, we want to remember to keep movement symmetrical. So once we are at this point, we are know we are really stressing the body, not in a good way. And so how, do we, how do, should we be thinking about symmetry and where does this start from? So if there's another point that we wanna leave you with tonight is that not to focus on the knee, not to focus on the foot, not to focus on one body part. Look at your body control overall, and this stems from the anchor point of your core. And what we mean by that are the abdominal muscles, the lumbar muscles, glutes, even the pelvic floor muscles must work together in unison to make a solid foundation from which the rest of your body moves around. So if you have a strong anchor point, you can then control the rest of the alignment of the knees, ankles, and feet and foot, where the fat, that foot lands, how it lands, and how you interact with the ground. And this is a really important point. Couple this with short, fast steps, and you can maintain this very lovely form that this anatomical person is showing you here on this screen. One of the ways we can also help with symmetry is to work on cadence. So cadence has emerged over the years as a really strong uh, factor that affects running form. And so a fast foot turnover or cadence, those are the words we're gonna use interchangeably, can really help reduce the time you can make mistakes during a step. So the faster your foot turnover, the faster your foot gets off the ground and back up in the air. And there's a lot of advantages to that. With reduced loading, there's reduced impact on your body and the softer it is for your body. So when the steps are fast and they're soft and they're quiet, it's an excellent method to really minimize the errors with your mechanics. Now, a myth that we tend to hear is, Based on what you've read in the lay literature or running publications, often there's a sound bite that comes with that to say, oh, your cadence has to be 180 steps a minute. Now, that's a good goal to be sure, but that's not always true. 180 might be a great, great target for some runners, but not necessarily for all. So we want you to think about this. When we test our runners and evaluate what they're doing, sometimes we get people that come in and their cadence is at 160 or 155, which is actually really low. And if we increase their cadence up by 10 or 15 steps a minute, their mechanics look terrific. So just be aware that each person has their own ideal cadence that's gonna give them the best mechanics and the lowest loading. And this is impacted uh, by height, weight, and age, for example. But in general, what we see are favorable mechanics when the, when the cadence is at least 165 and can go above 180, depending on that person. So there's some flux with that to play with what's going to work for you. But in general, the faster, the better. One of the areas we wanted to be sure that we touched, touched on today is that there's been a lot of hype about foot strike and foot strike type. And what does that mean? So the cartoon pictures here show three classic examples of the first, which is the heel striker, the second, which is the midfoot striker, and the third, which is the forefoot. 
And so I want to make some clarity here as we talk about this today. And the first is how your mechanics are operating. It's not just about foot strike. It's how your foot interacts with the ground. So I want to reframe how we think about this and think about soft versus hard landings on the ground. And here's why. So if we look at the first picture, clearly this person is doing more than just striking with the heel. There's some not so good other mechanics going on here, including a very hard heel drive to the ground, an extended leg and a huge overstride. Those are also factors that contribute to how poorly this person is interacting with the ground. So it's not just about the heel strike. If this person landed on the heel softly with a bent knee and the foot was under the hips, we could probably do pretty well with that. So let's take the context of the next two pictures of the midfoot strike and the forefoot strike. What these two runners are doing is something very nice and that is they're bringing their foot closer toward landing under their hips, which is a very important feature about healthy running. So how your foot interacts with the ground really is a whole concept. It involves strike, it involves control, and it involves a bend at the knee. So here we want to encourage you to think about soft controlled landings really can control the loading rate and the forces applied on the bones and joints. And this can most likely be accomplished with fast turnover and getting that foot to land softly under the hips instead. Interestingly, when you change your cadence and increase the cadence, your foot naturally comes off the heel, which is, which is kind of nice. So it's a very good cue to turn into. The next thing is let the foot, leg, and hip muscles be your shock absorbers. So the two runners that are shown with the uh, midfoot strike and the forefoot strike, they're activating their muscles to dampen the loading when they land. So consider all of these features are working together in addition to the foot strike type. So at a fast cadence, an active use of the muscles that we've talked about, this is gonna soften the impact and we'll start to shift that foot getting off the heel anyway. So those are some good cues to think about. I also wanna point out that just because somebody hits with a four foot strike, they might still have really high impact forces and be struggling with fractures. And we've seen that in the sports performance center and the clinics. So we've had to teach people to think about how to use foot strike as part of an overall approach to running. So here, what we've done is we've combined these key uh, features about healthy running. This is hot off the press. And I wanna thank our colleagues at the American College of Sports Medicine we develop a lot of materials for consumers and for uh, people in the community like the attendees here today, like all of you. Please take advantage of the brochures and educational materials. There are lots of them available on the ACSM website. And this one is was specific for running and we push this through to, through to try and get this prepared for tonight. So this is a great summary of the techniques that you can use going forward whether you're starting running or you're tweaking your form. I also want to introduce something new tonight, and that might be for those who are starting a running program or maybe have frequent bouts of injuries and can't quite figure out what's going on. I wanna introduce a concept called grounded running tonight. And I wanna make a comparison from the top running sequence to the second running sequence. The top running sequence shows the typical or traditional running where the person takes a step, lands on the ground, pushes off and leaps into the air and then strikes the ground again. So here there is a clear flight phase in this upper panel. The second set of pictures shows what's called a grounded running technique. And uh, this has emerged over the last three to four years or so is something to think about where we're almost eliminating the flight phase and just getting the foot up off the ground and coming in almost like a shuffle. And so some runners naturally tend to use this because it feels comfortable on their joints and may work for them. So, oops, I apologize. So when might this be advantageous and why? So if we think about the uh, flight phase and impact on the ground, there's going to be higher forces here and a little bit tougher on the joints, whereas grounded running is much softer, uh, it's gentler on the joints and actually can be performed by people who are advanced age. 
So if we look at some of our master's runners, 70 years plus, they adopt closer to a grounded running technique than the typical. In addition, our runners that are carrying some excessive weight or who might just be starting, this might be the way to go. Don't let anybody tell you that this is a wrong running form. It's just a different running form. And whether you adopt one or the other, you're still a runner. Now, if you're going to decide to switch to this form from the traditional, understand that initially this might be more fatiguing for you. One, you're not used to doing it, so you're gonna be using different muscles. But second, you're spending more time on the ground and using muscles for longer. So it's going to feel a little bit more tiring at first and let your muscles get conditioned to it and adapt. So you can use either of these techniques for successful running. We'll switch gears a little bit and share with you what we've learned over the years, as well as incoming science about injury prevention. And so one of the things that is clearly emerging is that if you wanna be a better runner, run a little bit less and incorporate in some other activities. So I'm going to ask Dr. Kevin to uh, join me on discussing this part uh, with respect to bringing in other activities. I think you may be muted. Heather, can you hear me now or no? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, technology, even though I wasn't muted, it wasn't on for a second. So uh, one of the things that research shows is that runners have an idea that we should just run. And the more you run, the better you're going to get. But actually what that shows is that you're overstressing the body parts and leading to more fatigue and more overuse injuries. So if you take a work from Mike Fredrickson, who's a, probably the best running medicine physician in the world out at Stanford, they looked at over 750 uh, athletes and looked at stress fractures and found that bone stress type injuries, stress fractures uh, of all levels, were actually different and reduced in people that participated or runners that participated in other activities than just running. So they did ball sports like soccer, basketball, tennis. It was putting stress to the bone in different directions and different ways. So the bones became more resilient and less prone to stress fracture. When you're running, you get a lot of density, but in more of a linear pattern than the whole circumference of the bone. So only parts are more resistant. And if you start to change your gait because of fatigue or other issues where you're ramping up too quickly, you actually can be more at risk for those stress fractures. There was a study that was done just on high school cross country runners, and they took one group, half of them, they took a third of the running out and added just strength training and then measured them over the next eight weeks of the season. And the group that was doing less running and more strength training ended up improving their times more and performing better than the runners who had just run throughout the entire season. So the idea is sometimes to be a better runner, maybe you do need to run a little bit less but focus on the strengthening because that's where you're going to see your form gets better by improving the muscular endurance. Uh, that group of single leg squats is very important because as people run, if they start to fatigue, their form falls apart. Well, if you do work on strength and endurance, in addition to running and not just focus on running, you'll find your injury resistance is better. We get a bunch of runners who come through the clinic that they started training for a marathon and because they needed to get in the miles, they got rid of their strengthening and that's when they ended up getting hurt. So resistance training and participation in other activities, particularly ones with medial lateral movement, change your body's adaptation and stress that it's going to experience and actually decrease your risk of injury. Thank so. you. We've also learned, and these pictures are actually from some of the research that we've done in our lab, about the importance of how serious it can be when there's crossover with running. And if we look at the top picture of uh, this person, you can see as they're landing their foot almost directly under the center of their body. And that's not a position where you want that leg to be in. If you look at the bone um, model right next to it, you can see where there's a blue arrow that's showing a direction of where that impact force is being directed and it is not up and down through the long bones where we want it to be. So that's putting a lot of stress at the knee and a lot of the soft tissues. And so foot crossover really stresses the knee joint, the IT band and increases injury risk at the hip, knee and the ankle. So we wanna try and avoid this if we can over time. It's also related to tibial stress fractures. 
So the folks that we've had come in, whether they're high school runners all the way up through master's runners, if they're doing a lot of serious crossover, we tend to see tibial stress reactions in these runners. And so cues to help reduce this crossover that seem to work quite well and produce the second picture on the bottom here, where we see the leg is now landing more under the hip rather than under the center of the body. You can pretend that your feet are running on either side of a road line, or if you're, you have a track to practice on, practice getting your feet on either side of the line rather than crossing over. Another thing to think about is envisioning pedaling a bicycle and keeping the feet parallel. You can imagine a jump roping motion, which is also a great cross training in preparedness for running. And also fast cadence. All of those types of cues seem to help with bringing a little bit of width to the stride and getting, uh, getting the foot out from, from under the center of the body. So this is really important. We also want to think about controlling symm symmetry through other methods. And the first one I want to show you here is called abdominal bracing. So this is an activity that no matter what time of day or whether you're running or not, we actually all should be practicing abdominal bracing. So this is the concept of activating the core muscles to place the pelvis in a neutral position. And what this series of pictures is showing is the person on the top you can see is kind of lean forward and the buttocks are sticking out a little bit behind. And what this person is doing is putting the fingers in the abdomen tensing it to feel that the muscles are getting a little tension and she's adjusted and tucked the tail ever so slightly and brought the pelvis into a neutral position. But now the lumbar muscles, the abdominal muscles, the pelvic muscles are all activated and that's a really good place to be. What this does is it helps support control of the steps and the loading on the ground. And it's really hard to run poorly when your muscles are firing. But what you can also do to complement this are a few other cues. First, aim to keep your kneecaps facing forward. This opens up your hips a little bit and keeps nice parallel steps. Squeeze the gluteal muscles together, which is also a really good cue and it feels really awkward at first, but it can really help. And then third, also a very big one. When we control the arm swing of our body, we can control the lower body movement. And so with a simple cue of rather than swinging the arms in front of the body with a lot of rotation, if you can keep them from side to side, what you're doing is reducing the crossover and the, the asymmetry that can happen. So arms can help drive the lower body movement as well. Very simple cues that you can enact today. One of the things I also want to talk about too is when we think about Injury prevention is really watching step length. That um, there is a myth out there that to reach faster running speeds that you really need to take longer strides. The emphasis is stride longer, keep reaching out. And that really is a myth. And consider instead, if even if you look at the elite trained athletes, but also those who are durable and protecting themselves, the technique that they're using is to use hips hiking the hips a little bit more and driving forward and lifting knees more to cover the distance and clear the ground rather than reaching straight out to get that speed. So I want to give you a comparison uh, that the long strides rather than short strides often result in really hard ground impacts. They tend to be more on the heel. They tend to be less controlled with higher impacts and usually with crossover. So this is actually a great picture below to show these two runners. Uh, the first gentleman here that you can see in the lead, the technique that he's using is he's lifting more from the hip using a bend at the knee, but look at where his foot is going to land. By the time it reaches the ground, it's almost going to be directly under his hips. And that's where we want it to be. He is also off his heel. So he's leveraging his hips and cycling his hips more to get that speed. Whereas the second guy behind him, if you look where the technique he's using, he's swinging his legs straight out and reaching. So clearly he's using an overstriding technique. And when he hits the ground, he's gonna slam hard with the heel. And that's a, a breaking motion and he's fighting his body every time he takes a step. So this is the technique that unfortunately contributes more to injuries rather than the gentleman in the front. Even our elites like Mo Farah. Now, that being said, 
uh, there are very few like this gentleman, but I wanted to show this picture because we get the, the argument sometimes as well, the professionals take these enormous strides. Now I submit that, but I also wanna show what else that he's doing. So if you watch his technique, the reach that he has is incredible and his stride is enormous. But what he's also doing is look at the position of his front leg. He's got a bent knee. And by the time that front leg cycles around, that foot is gonna be closer to landing under his hip and it's gonna be off the heel. You can also see, look at the muscles in his legs, that they are all firing and he's got great control of his trunk muscles. So putting all this together, this is a very controlled landing despite a longer stride. So keep all these factors in mind. These are the same techniques that are used whether you're not elite or you're elite. In addition to prevent injury, our durable runners make time to do strengthening exercise. And so I wanna share with you a variety of things that if you're not already doing this, please consider adding this as part of your running program. And so we've split uh, this table into two things that relate to strengthening and then strengthening with a balance component. And these are very important to support that single leg posture when you're out in the, in the running environment. So the exercises on the left are a lot for strengthening and building control, like wall, uh, wall squats or wall sits, front and side lunges, heavy squats and deadlifts with barbells. Don't be afraid to do heavy weights to get you stronger and give you power. Walking lunges or split squats. You can even include trunk rotation if you wish. You can use kettlebells, but get some weights in your program. The exercises that involve balance components, which are also critical, include Romanian deadlifts or single-legged squats with or reaches in different directions, using uh, standing clamshells and lateral shuffles, osu ball, wobble boards, and hip hikes. Dr. Kevin, I'm going to have you go ahead and add some comments. So what I wanted to make clear is a lot of times you'll see pay runners, they'll be in physical therapy or they're going to work on hip strength. And you see a lot of exercises being done on a mat on the ground. That's okay to add some basic strength to the hip musculature, particularly gluteus, medius, and minimus, which are giving stability. So when you lift one leg off the ground and the other one's on the ground, those gluteal muscles are firing to keep your pelvis straight and your knee straight. What you quickly want to be able to do is do the majority of your strengthening on your feet. Because think about what you're trying to get strong to do is to run and to be in the air and to land and maintain that balance and stability. So you can get basic strength with clamshells and things on the ground, but you quickly got to transition from that to being on your feet and then even onto one foot. And when you're doing those exercises, make sure you've got something lightweight on your foot. You can do a barefoot, you can do lifting socks, you can do minimal shoes, because in addition to your hip, there's 19 muscles in your foot. And we'll talk about that when we get to shoes, but those, those muscles have to fire to give stability and you wanna train them because you want a strong responsive foot. If you're in therapy or doing exercises where all of them you're on the ground, you need to kind of keep transition very quickly to being up in the air because you don't run lying on the ground. You don't run strapped to a machine like the abductor machines. You're running in the free environment in the air, landing on one leg. So make sure you're incorporating things where you're standing as part of your program. Dr. Evans. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. So here's a, for those who are pictorially inclined like myself, I do like pictures. Um, here, be sure to include, mix things up in the routine. And this is also great for people who like to run trails, especially when there's wobbly surface under your foot, or you like to run through woods or do mountain runs, whatever you like to do, all of these exercises are going to help prepare you for that. And what I want to show you is that th these are not static exercises. These are dynamic. And so under column A, where we talk about flexibility, these are all active flexibility exercises that are gonna prepare you for the running motion. The second column shows you uh, strengthening uh, endurance exercise here that you can do at the level of the foot uh, from ankle, ankle strengthening, toe grabs and foot doming, which we'll talk a little bit more at the end, from uh, bridging or balancing on unstable surfaces, and then building from there on leg, uh, leg musculature and multi-segment actions and balance are gonna be critical. And then finally, thinking about plyometrics. 
that running also does involve the plyometric movement. Um, so especially with trails where you might have to hop and navigate or get around objects or over trees or rocks or whatnot, these are also gonna be really important so that you can control the movement when you land. So consider adding some of these to mix up your routine. To actually avoid injury, you also need to listen to musculoskeletal pain. And so this is a very important thing that we have to re-educate a lot of our runners about, that pain is not normal with running. That is not a normal thing to push through. Now, some of you may be dealing with osteoarthritis pain. Some might have pain from a previous surgery, like if you had ACL repair or foot surgery or hip surgery, maybe you have nagging chronic pain. What we're talking about is new pain development with the onset or participation in running. If you make changes to anything in your program, whether it's distance, duration, speed, pay attention to this and track it. And when it does occur, write it down. What makes it worse or better? And recognize that pain is really an indication to you that this is about loading. And the cumulative loading that you're doing is either too much or it's the wrong kind of loading. So it, this goes back to the symmetry and the mechanics, or it's just too much too quickly. Dr. Kevin, any comments on the pain on this? Yeah, so the uh, things that I want runners to remember is when you're thinking about discomfort, you want to put it in different categories and think about a few things. There are times we're running where if you had to run completely pain-free, nobody would be out there running. So there's a little bit of discomfort at times, particularly if there's other orthopedic issues. Things you want to think about is the discomfort should be no more than mild. If it's like a one or a two on a 10 point scale and it's sort of in the background, that's typically okay. The second thing you want to think about is you're going out running and is the pain getting worse as you go? If something's a little tight, a little cranky when you first start and within a couple of minutes of a good warm up, it, it subsides and goes away, that's generally okay. We wanna monitor that to make sure that doesn't get worse over time. But generally, if you kind of warm up and it goes away, we're doing all right. If pain is worsening as you go, that's a bad sign. It means you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing and you might be developing an injury, it might be leading from an overload, which is just your tissue saying, I don't like what you're doing to actually becoming injured. So no more, no more than a mild discomfort. Pain shouldn't get worse while you go. The other thing that's important is you shouldn't limp or alter your gait because of pain. If you go back to what was said earlier is the symmetry of landing and the symmetry of motion. So if you have right knee pain, you're invariably gonna shift your forces over to the left side to make it go away and to unload it. Well, then you can start overloading the other side of your body and create more injuries. I typically like to treat the first injury that, that came along but I've had runners come in with five, six, seven injuries because they kept working around it so long until they had to stop. And then I have to really peel the onion to figure out where this all started. So we don't want uh, pain that changes your gait and then it shouldn't carry over later. So if you're, it's an aching and throbbing that night, like a toothache, if it aches the next day, not muscle soreness, but joint pain or bone pain or something that says this isn't quite right, that's what we need to know. So really be monitoring symptoms that are worsening over the run or worsening over time. Those are the things that we need to know about sooner. So before it becomes a bigger issue. Thank you. All right. So let's get to some fun stuff with respect to shoe design and strong feet. And so the question I just want to pose really, what is the purpose of a running shoe? And when you go to the store, you look online, what is it that you're actually looking at? and trying to decide. And so sometimes going back to the basics is really important. And the answer is really, a shoe is really meant to protect your feet from the environment, but it's not meant to do the work of the foot. And that at the core, if we go back to the mantra of keeping a strong body core, there's also the emphasis now of a foot core being strong. So within the foot itself, there's a new concept about the foot itself, it is very complex. It has numerous muscles and bones and ligaments and joints, and it has its center. And in order for that segment to function properly, we have to keep its core strong, which we'll talk about. And so I also wanna let you know that um, there is normal movement of the foot during running, and that the motion includes kind of three phases. So at foot contact, the foot supinates or kind of comes on the outside a little bit more on the heel. 
As you load and put your body weight on your foot, the foot actually pronates naturally and normally with distributing the, the, the weight. And then with push off, the foot supinates a little bit again. So there's a normal roll off. We want to keep this normal foot pattern. So if we get a runner that comes in and said, I've been told I pronate when I run, I'm glad you do. Because if you don't pronate and you stayed supinated, we'd be in trouble. It's the dramatic pronation or excess supination that's driven by shoe wear or weakness that we're concerned about. But just keep in mind, this is a natural foot motion pattern and that the, each of you has a different foot arch as well. And so if you go online, you are going to see shoe buying guides that say, if you step in water and then step on the ground and put your foot pattern on the ground, you might see what your arch looks like. The individual as number one has quote a flat foot, the number two person has a normal arch and the number three has a high arch. So go buy a shoe that's meant to support the arch. And that is absolutely not what we are wanting you to think about at this point. You were born with the arches that you have. And honestly, Dr. Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think over the whole time we've been doing this, we might've had two runners that actually needed to have special support because of severe arch related issues. The rest could be trained and so on. The, uh, the general rule of thumb in running. So you gotta sort of forget what you learn from shoe advertisements and shoe stores is the shape of your arch doesn't dictate the type of your running shoe. Your arch is gonna be dictated by your baseline anatomy. It's gonna be the intrinsic muscles that you have. Even if you have a flatter foot in one through a lot of intrinsic strengthening, you can build a little bit of arch if, if you wanted to. But the pushing up of the shoe, like you see all the way to the left under, under one, is going to push up into that arch a little too much support because you're going to feel something pushing into it. But I want you to think about a concept. When you think about those shoes that have a lot of stability, look at the three shoes on that screen, numbers one and number two, that different gray, if, Heather, if Dr. Heather can put the little arrow on it, that you see on that instep, it's meant to really prevent you from over pronating. But all of that material tells you that it's different on the medial or the inside part of the shoe compared to the outside. And it's trying to block you from rolling over. But think about this. The more stability you put in that shoe, the less the muscles have to do. So if I was going to put a cast on your arm, what would happen to the muscle in your arm? It's going to atrophy. So if I put you in a big shoe with a lot of stability, what are the muscles in your foot doing? They're not doing much. So they're going to get more atrophy and weaker. So you're going to have a weaker, less responsive, lazier foot. Then you're going to have to put more stuff in it. You're going to get orthotics and you're going to get more stability when really you should work on more, getting a stronger, more responsive foot. The other thing to remember when uh, Dr. Heather mentions over pronating, think about a lot of runners and you're, you can all practice this in a second, is if you stand up and put your hands on your hips and stand on one leg and bend your knee about 30 degrees, three times up and down, is your knee driving in? Are you falling over? That stability in most of the runners is being driven by the strength of the rotators at your hip. If your hip, your hip basically lines up your femur. So if your hip is weak, your femur drops in. If your, if your femur drops in, your knee goes in. If your knee goes in, your foot goes in. Somebody at a shoe store stares at your foot and says you overpronate. You didn't overpronate because of a problem at your foot. You overpronated because of a problem at your hip. So you're attacking the problem from the bottom when you should be attacking it from the stop, on the top. Most runners, we strengthen the hip. They can go into a much lighter, easier shoe. If you go to a shoe store, what are the three reasons or what are the top three reasons people pick a running shoe? And this is what I get in clinic all the time. Number one is it was on sale. Number two, I like the color. And number three, the shoe store guy told me to get it. And for most of the chain shoe stores, not only are you going to come out with likely a stability shoe, you're going to come out with an over-the-counter orthotic because that's how a lot of them will make their money, whether you needed one or not. So what you also have to think about when you're buying a shoe is what is the philosophy of the shoe? Dr. Heather, what was on your next slide? Because I might just, I might need uh, those shoes. Uh, we're going to talk so, a little bit about Yeah, so what I wanted just to go over, and then I'll, I'll let Dr. Heather go, is when you're looking at a shoe, understand the philosophy of the shoe. You don't just jump shoes because of color, sale, and other things. If you're in a Brooks uh, Adrenaline, and then you say, hey, you know what, maybe I'll jump into an, an Asics Nimbus, or I'll go into a Brooks Ghost, well, your foot is going to experience those much different, or you're going to go into an, like an ultra Escalante. 
is if you go from something that's thick with stability to something that's lighter, to something that's neutral, to something that's motion, that changes the experience of force throughout your body. And those abrupt changes really can lead to injury and can lead to problems. And I think Dr. Heather is going to talk about that in a minute. But buying a shoe is understanding philosophically what the shoe is trying to do with your foot. And if you don't understand that, then you're setting yourself up for injury down the road. So those are important things to remember. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Heather and jump in again. Sure, thank you. Um, all critically important points. So one of the things that we are really trying to do is help the community weed through all this information that consumers are bombarded with. The number of uh, running shoes is overwhelming. The information about them is overwhelming. Uh, the, the consumer uh, blogging and, and communications and, and media about it can be really confusing. So we're just gonna hit the high points here that are critical to understand. And so when we look at the definitions of what we're considering different shoe types today, <clears throat> if we look at the back view and the side view, when we talk about a minimal shoe, what we are referring to are shoes that have a very thin sole, they don't have any support in it, no arch support, no inserts, nothing like that. And they're very lightweight, they're very flexible, very bendable. They allow the foot to get into its appropriate position during landing, it's anatomically correct. The moderate or traditional shoe is where you start to get some variations and maybe there's some posting in there or some control of how the foot is moving. It's mid thickness, they're a little bit heavier, some support. And then there's the maximal shoe. I think this is the year of the maximal shoe. The crazy designs are out. And so if we look at the very thick soles, it's like running on a pillow with lots of support in there. They're very heavy. Sometimes they're stiff, sometimes they're incredibly soft and both have their pitfalls related to those depending on if it's foam or very, very stiff. So just for today, we're gonna to talk about those definitions. And then we've got to throw in there another, another twist. The shoes can also have, uh, in addition to the stack height, which is the, the thickness of the heel, but also a heel to toe drop. So this is basically a change from the heel height down to the toe. What kind of pitch are we seeing from heel to toe? And so the picture demonstrates on the right side here, a zero drop means there's no difference in or thickness of the sole from the heel to the toe versus one that has a 10 millimeter drop, which is pretty significant. It means that the, you're driving your foot down into the ground almost like a wedge. So if you were to have a maximal shoe with a big drop, we are completely changing the mechanics of the foot from the ground up. And that's gonna be a lot of adaptation. And so let me ask the group here, as we sort of look at these two shoe models, we have the puffy Hoka over here on the left. And by the way, there, we do not have any relationships with any of these companies. We just wanted to show two models here today. So the Hoka on the left, and then we have the zero on the right, which is a minimal shoe. Which one do you think is associated with greater impact forces on the ground? And so if we process that, the answer is actually the Hoka. And so there's more evidence to show that not only when people put on a nice thick comfy shoe, it feels good and it's spongy and it's soft, People go out and start pounding the, literally pounding the pavement because they can. So they try and do things they wouldn't ordinarily do if they weren't in that shoe. And that's where the danger comes. In addition, the other point I wanna make is that a new study just came out showing that once you adopt this pattern, the pattern actually doesn't change over time. So it behooves us to think about safe mechanics and what shoes are going to promote healthier running behavior. Dr. Kevin? So one of the th reasons that ends up being shocking to people is this, is remember if you're dampening your sensitivity to the ground, like think about putting pillows over your ears and you walk into a room when people are talking, you won't be able to hear them as much because you decrease the sensitivity. So, or you wrap a bunch of things around your arm and then somebody touches it, you can't sense as much. Same thing with your shoe. The more foam you put between your foot and the ground, you can't feel how you're hitting. So people with a more thickened shoe hit the ground harder and run poorly because they can. They don't feel it to know that they're paying for it with higher forces. The person with a lightweight shoe, they can feel the ground and if they run wrong, it hurts. So what the lightweight shoe allows you to do is sense the ground, feel it and adapt a softer, lighter landing than the more maximal shoe. 
Now in the maximal shoe, because you're hitting harder, you're getting all those extra shocks, but you don't really pay for it then. That's what accumulates down the road and leads to the stress injuries and the failure of tissues. So a cushion shoe allows you to run badly, but not pay for it now, you pay for it later. The lightweight shoe, because you can feel it, it you make sure that you're landing softly and you make the correct adaptation. And that's why that it's a counterintuitive question of which one causes more forces. Well, because in the Hoke, you don't pay for it till later. Zero, you pay for it today. So, Dr. Heather. What's also interesting as well is that when we bring runners in for their assessments, often we get people that bring in different kinds of shoes to test. So they'll come in with a thicker shoe and a thinner shoe and find which one is healthier for them. Almost invariably and consistency, when they switch from the thicker shoe to the thinner, the cadence naturally goes up, the foot, so the stride length uh, widens a little bit, the step length decreases a little bit, and it's softer impact. They're not even thinking about it, they just react differently. So that's something to think about as you're going forward with your, with your choices. And so why is this happening? As Dr. Kevin pointed out, it changes sensation with the ground. In addition, there's a time delay. So with a fat shoe, there's going to be a time delay from when your body figures out that contact has been made from when the signal hits the heel, it gets to the brain, the brain has to turn around and react. And by then you've already sunk into mechanics which aren't so good. And so this means that foot pronation really increases and there's more time spent in pronation, which can hurt. And this means those forces go further up your knees might hurt, your IT band, or your hip. So we have more exaggerated movement with the thicker shoe. And this scale over here is just a really nice visual representation of the shift in sensation of what you feel when you put something different on your feet. And so a reminder, a shoe should simply be there to protect your foot, not by purchase by art shape or color or sales or price or any of those things, what is going to do the job to get you safe mechanics? And so uh, another myth that I wanna bring up, I hear quite a bit, or I see bloggers talk about it, or I read social media, that there's a responsive shoe out there and that responsive shoes are really good for long runs. And the way I interpret this to mean is that responsive generally means to the springiness and bounce of the shoe, it responds to the ground. But unfortunately, that means the more bounce to the shoe, the less work the foot's doing to respond to the ground. In addition, there's some science to show that these types of shoes make you actually expend less energy because the shoe is doing the work. It's catapulting you back up with each step. So if you're concerned about caloric expenditure and want it to burn calories, we're defeating the purpose a little bit by having a squashier shoe. And in addition, we just get progressive foot weakness if the, foot, if the shoe is actually doing the work. So some healthy shoe considerations, what should we be looking for? We do have a nice handout if anyone is interested in it um, with some makes and models that are out there if anyone is interested. For healthy shoe considerations for uh, men and for women, it's less than eight or nine ounces with a really nice wide toe box. So the toes can naturally splay and help distribute force when you land on that foot. That's really important. Narrow shoes are gonna squeeze those metatarsals together and be irritating and maybe cause aromas or pinching. And we don't want that either. So a nice wide toe box is important with moderate to low cushioning if possible and a minimal to no uh, uh, heel to toe drop. So if you're considering transitioning from the thicker to the thinner, going the cold turkey as Dr. Kevin described really is, is not the best choice uh, because sudden changes to shoe wear really uh, without allowing adaptation or your foot strengthening can cause the following. It can cause rapid and immediate glute and calf soreness because now you're using muscles in a way that you hadn't before um, and it's very uncomfortable. But also it acutely increases Achilles tendon strain and loading rate and causes pain. So if you've tried to do that and you've tried to make the switch and you say, oh, those shoes were bad for me, they hurt me, think that it may not be the shoe, it could have just been the transition process and it might be worth giving it another try under guidelines we'll share next. And then finally, one of the big things that happened over the last few years is that when you don't allow the foot to adapt and strengthen over weeks to a couple months, that ultimate damage can lead to ultimately metatarsal stress fractures 
or fractures higher up on the kinetic chain. And that's very unfortunate. So it's not the shoe's fault, it's just making sure that you plan ahead on how to do it. So how do we do it? We can use one approach if you're willing to reduce your running volume and cut back and start using the shoe right away, that's okay. But recognize that you can't use the new shoe with the same volume. You've either got to cut the volume first and initially just wear your new thinner shoes around the house doing non-impact activities for about four weeks. And this is some of the work that we've published as well. Just get used to it. Allow your, your feet and your body to acclimate and then implement the following protocol. So you see that the total time of running, maybe for you that's lower than what it was, um, or maybe if you're starting a program, this might be the way to go. Give it a go with just this kind of program. And so one minute running with three minutes walking in this new shoe. And then you see a gradual shift over time where it becomes progressively more and more running. And then eventually it can shift to all running. That's a good way to go. And then let me just do one more thing, Dr. Kevin, and then I'll, I'll have you talk. But if you're not willing to reduce the running volume, this is where we can get into some trouble. So we have to do a little bit of negotiating here. And that means, again, do the same approach as the other folks, is wear the new shoes first around the house. But then start to introduce your new shoes into very short runs at first, no more than 10% of your volume. And then slowly add more volume each week, no more than 10% of these new shoes until that full volume is achieved. <clears throat> Go ahead, Dr. Kevin. Uh, very important to note that most of the protocols or reasons why people got injured before, like Dr. Heather said, when they switched to Vibrams, is just putting them on and going for a run. Your tissue has to adapt to the new loading and the slowest adapter is gonna be bone and next slowest is tendon. The stress fractures, the rate of loading they can accept when you go from your cushion shoe to a minimal shoe is, is much different because there's a lot more stress and you're gonna shift more to that forefoot type of a landing and there's a lot more fulcrum. So when you look at the protocols, they look really slow. And I will tell you that no patient has ever liked them. The return to run programs are too slow. The transition programs are too slow because mentally they want to go, but their, their bone doesn't and the tendon doesn't. So they are meant to allow the tissue to adapt safely and you're just happier out there doing it more so than at the pace you would like to get going. And, and don't skip stages. Everybody I've seen get injured during one of these return programs or transition programs did so because they skip stages or advance too quickly. They're all designed to make the bone adapt and the tendon adapt. Uh, and, and it's really more frustrating for you mentally. You're just investing in the change. So Dr. Heather. All right. So going shoe shopping, has this happened to you? So you enter the shoe store and you talk to the associate and they watch you walk around or maybe run or run, run back and forth in the store and get you on a little nifty treadmill in there. And they tell you, you overpronate, you need a stability shoe. And let, let me give you some inserts that go with that. I can't tell you the unfortunate number of people that come in with this issue. And sometimes it actually leads to injuries. So the wrong foot prescribed for the wrong reason means you pay a lot of money for extension shoes that you just don't, and devices you don't need. And so now you know, hopefully we've given you the information going forward, you really don't need an excessive shoe. And we cannot think of a case where the average runner, in fact, most people don't need a big, thick, heavy stability shoe. What you need is a strong foot because otherwise the foot is gonna to continue to weaken and the mechanics are gonna get worse. And this is wrong. And this is enough to make everybody angry. It's a waste of money. And then they have to go back to the shoe store and buy something different. And so proper shoe fitting when you go is also going to be really important. This is some information we've also published. These are some key things. Again, you can implement starting today, tomorrow, whenever you get your next pair of shoes. Understanding that the shoe length should have a little bit of space, a thumbnail longer than the longest toes of your foot, usually the first or second. And that the width and shape of the foot of the shoe should match your foot shape. So you can actually take the little colored insert out of, the, out of the shoe, put it on the floor and step on it. And if the foot drapes over it, that's not the right size shoe for you. Size the foot later in the day when the foot's the largest and then pay attention to the shape of the heel and heel fitting to avoid slippage. 
Don't tie the shoe up too tight to compensate for that because then you can also get foot pain on the top of the foot, which we have also seen as well. So the fitting of the heel is also going to be really important. And also be sure to measure the length of each foot because we have variations between feet. And that way you can make sure that each shoe is going to fit appropriately. And then the last thing I want to bring up before we take questions is being sure to strengthen your feet. And there are some protocols out there that you can use, but this is something we can't skip. So no matter what stage you are in your training, whether you're a novice or you're an elite, strong feet are critical for injury prevention. And so there's some great protocols out there that involve not just massage, but using tennis balls to roll under the feet. And you can use the ball for gripping and picking up the ball and moving it, or you can pick up marbles with your toes. You can take a towel and scrunch the towel with your toes and pull it toward you. Playing the piano with your toes or drumming your toes, or using movements that cause your ankle to move outward against resistance. So using a TheraBand and pulling the foot against it. Those are different options that you can use. But a really good one that's received a lot of attention here is called short foot exercise or foot doming. And it feels really weird when you do it, but it's very effective. It can actually increase the size and the strength of your intrinsic foot muscles of your arch. And so what this picture shows is a foot that's just sitting neutrally on the ground. And what is the trickiest part to figure out is how to activate and fire those muscles of your feet to almost contract and make an arch. Don't curl the toes. You're actually just shortening or trying to contract those muscles of the midfoot. So there's only a slight difference in length that you're going to see of the midfoot, but it makes such a huge difference on foot strength, foot control, and thickness of those muscles. Dr. Kevin, did you want to mention anything about those exercises? Nope, I, I, that was perfect. Okay. Uh, at this point, we would love to open the floor for questions and answers. And the big summary points to leave you with today is that even making simple adjustments to your running mechanics to keep symmetry, developing strength of your musculoskeletal system, and considering the options that we've talked about for healthy running shoe design and having a strong foot, you're going to be in great shape to uh, be well on your way for a nice long running career. These are our contacts. If anyone wants to reach out, set appointments, come see us. We would love to have you here. And uh, at this point, uh, Marsha, however, you would like to open the question and answer session. We are happy to do that. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Our first question is, it says, I'd like to make the jump from running, from running marathons, but ultra marathon to ultra marathons. I'm kind of scared about getting injured by jumping up in mileage. I don't have any history of injury. How can you help point me in the right direction? Excellent. So the thing to think about is doing it slow enough and planning that event far enough out. So when you talk about ultras, those are going to be different lengths. They can be a, a you go from your standard marathon to 50 milers, there's 75, there's hundreds. What you want to think about is when you're increasing the volume to that you'd say for your body is increasing no more than about 10% of that total mileage per week. Uh, at that rate, there's some data that looks even up to 20%, but the standard has been about 10% per week is safe. Think about that first ultra if you're going from marathon level to ultra level to get all those miles of training in and do it safely at that rate. You're generally planning your race a year out. You want to give yourself about that much time to get to that new level and make sure that you're keeping in the strengthening and the cross training. And you might have to supplement some of your miles, not with running, but with cycling elliptical. If you have any other orthopedic limitations or start to notice musculoskeletal pain. So when you're making that level of a jump, you want to plan your first race a year down the road. Wow. That's, that's a big jump. That's a, that's a great goal. Great goal. Uh, that's a big jump. Yeah. So someone said, can you provide any tips for tightening or squeezing your glutes while you're running? I find it very difficult to do. Me too. I, so I'm loved. I'd like to hear this one too. <laughs> so actually Dr. Dr. Kevin's trick, it, it sounds a little odd, but imagine, um, squeezing a grape between the buttocks. <laughs> so if you can imagine just isolating, isolating that spot and really just trying to do that. 
Um, another way to practice that too is you can also um, just even in a standing position, get on one leg, pretending like you're doing single leg balance and work on just squeezing the buttock muscles, even on one leg, just practicing with balance. If you remember what that sensation feels like and where those muscles are, then might help translate when you're actually doing the running of which muscles and where to squeeze. Great question. All right. Um, someone wants to know, is it okay to run with osteoarthritis in your knee and is it gonna make it worse? So that's a great question. I will yeah. tell you the first thing is, is running does not cause knee arthritis. So there's this concern about if I run, I'm gonna get arthritis. Running in of itself and the contracting and relaxing of the cartilage helps to bring in nutrients and growth. It's running with abnormal form or on an injured knee that can lead to degenerative changes. We have a lot of runners in our community with arthritis. So what you look at is adapting a healthier form. So runners with arthritis in their knee are typically gonna have a shorter stride uh, and a really soft landing and a, and a quick little turnover because they're trying to dampen forces. The other thing to remember, depending on where the arthritis is, if you have a stability shoe with that medial post, it's gonna tilt your foot out and that's gonna tilt your knee out and it compresses that part of your knee and increases the pain of arthritis. Or if you've had a meniscectomy in your knee, like from arthroscopic surgery, a higher heel rise is gonna tilt your knee forward and put more strain onto your kneecap and patellofemoral arthritis. So what you look at is a flatter, more neutral shoe. Uh, we also do a lot of strengthening. So if you have arthritis, you, if you strengthen again, I know it sounds like we're saying it over and over again, but if you strengthen the hip and it rotates the femur out, you decompress some of the stress on the knee. What I tell the runners with arthritis though, are these are some very simple tips, is your knee is gonna tell you what it likes and what it doesn't like. It is a wonderful talker, it is a terrible listener. So if it says, today I can run three miles, but you want to run five, today you're running three. If it says, today I don't wanna run at all, today you're not running. If you force it to do the things it, you want to do, it doesn't, you will not get along. Look at really reducing the amount of increase you can do. So if, if a program was 12 weeks, yours might be stretching it out to 18 and try not to run on consecutive days where runners get in trouble with or, or knee arthritis, even hip arthritis, is they wanna run Monday and then it starts to ache when they run on Tuesday and by Wednesday they run and they're in a lot of pain. Running and doing impact on non-consecutive days will work. Uh, if there's any issues with that, if you're, if you're local, this is the kind of thing that we do all the time and talking to runners with knee arthritis about what their healthy strategies are and what things we can do to help them out. But the answer is yes, you can do it. Yes, it will make it worse because the gait cycles will wear it down, but it's also gonna be doing things that help to make it healthy. So it's a little bit of both, but the mental fun and the stress release you're gonna get from running typically outweigh the issues going on in the knee. But there's also things we can do with synovial type fluid injections that decrease the wear and tear in the knee as well. So there's a lot of options if you have knee arthritis. Okay, great. Um, someone asked a question, do you evaluate runners who are not currently injured? Yes. Yes. So wax actually one of my personal favorites is I like, and I, I don't know, Dr. Heather, you can jump in. I like when runners come and talk to me before they're really injured or something just lightly hurts because that gives us a chance to optimize and correct things before it becomes a bigger yes. problem. It's also a good idea if you're that person trying to do the ultra that just talked earlier, or if you're doing a 5K and want to go to halves or halves and want to go to fulls, because if you have a little perturbation in gait that we can get rid of while you're doing, while you're healthy, it will prevent you as you're getting those miles to wear down your system. So optimizing gait so that you can make those next transitions or be more efficient uh, are one of my favorite things to do because then I don't have a limitation to work around injury wise, we get to go right after it with the therapy and the, and the training. Yeah, the, the other thing I want to add to that is that one of my favorite things as well is also getting the families that come in. So the, the parents that bring the child who may have either started cross country and they're not sure if the mechanics look right, they're not injured, but we evaluate them early so they can preemptively make those corrections and hopefully develop the healthy habits for life. So we try and set them up at the start of their career going forward. Okay. I had several different questions about what do you think about barefoot running and barefoot running on a beach? So, so barefoot running is interesting. If you think about it, you've been running for hundreds of thousands of years before you had shoes and you were doing just fine. The advent of the shoes with cushion didn't start until the seventies. And there's a great story about that where it was three podiatrists that consulted with Nike and they were the advent of the stability shoes. However, Barefoot running is fine if you can protect your foot from the ground because there's a lot of obstacles out there, but you have to condition your foot to be really tough to be able to handle it. 
So think more about uh, transitioning to a minimal shoe that will protect your foot from the ground. The data on that says you're gonna get a strong responsive foot. You're gonna have really nice light and landings. Running on a beach is good if you're used to it. So if you go to this really exotic location, you don't run on the beach and you say, I'm gonna take my shoes off and go for a run. You're gonna get really sore uh, because your muscles are now doing a lot more work as you're sinking into the sand. Working your way into running on the beach is gonna get your feet a lot stronger and make them more responsive. So it's, if you're gonna do things, remember, runners get in trouble with abrupt transitions. If you do something you don't normally do, that's when you're gonna to get to make an appointment with me and come and see me instead of Dr. Heather. Uh, so if you're gonna do it, keep that volume low. If you're not used to doing it, make a, a nice transition, do a little walk running. So minimal running is very healthy for your foot because that's what you did long before you had shoes. Uh, so just because you put shoes on doesn't mean you should run wrong. So I think it's fine. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but if you do it correctly, it can be very healthy. All right. Um, someone says, if I deal with plantar fasciitis, are there any minimalist shoes that you recommend or sources I can find for those? You know what's fascinating about the literature on that topic is if you take people with, with plantar fasciitis, they have typically been put in uh, rolling ice on it, putting orthotics in the shoe, giving them more art support. And what the literature actually will show is if you take all that stuff out and put them in a more minimal shoe, the plantar fasciitis goes away. The reason is not everybody who says they have plantar fasciitis actually has plantar fasciitis. On the bottom of your foot, the plantar fascia is two to four millimeters of a, a non-contractile tissue that gives support. There's four layers of muscles that insert at the same place. So one of the things you'll see is the inflammation is the strain on the muscles that aren't either the flexibility is off from the great toe or around the heel. So if you start training their foot and letting their foot do its job, because your foot knows what to do if you get out of its way. So if you put people in a more minimal shoe, you'll find their plantar fasciitis goes away, their patellofemoral pain goes away because they adopt normal, healthy loading mechanics and normal strength around those body parts. So there's no particular minimal shoe that's better than another for plantar fasciitis. They're all in that same category. So whether it's a Vivo Barefoot, a, a New Balance Minimus, a Zero, they're all gonna have that same effect if you walk and transition to them slowly and appropriately, like Dr. Heather said. But it's interesting you say to, to do that because you'll have a lot of people that are putting more and more stuff in a shoe to get rid of plantar fasciitis. When you gotta do is take it all out yeah, and uh, go back to basics. But that was a great question. All right, uh, and then we've also had some similar questions like, do you have any brands or anywhere place I should look for wide or double wide widths um, yeah. or to accommodate a bunion? So the bunion is an interesting issue. And it's also, if you have your bunionette, one on the, uh, on the fifth metatarsal as well. So a wide toe box, narrow heel shoe to prevent slippage, because you don't want just a wide shoe because that's gonna make the whole thing wide and you'll have all kinds of foot slippage. The two most prominent brands, and remember, we're not sponsored by anybody, I'm just gonna tell you, are Ultra, A-L-T-R-A, and Topo, T-O-P-O. They make a wide forefoot, narrow rear foot running shoe that can accommodate what you're talking about and your toes get to splay out. So if you're looking for width in regular shoes, those are the two most common. If you're in a minimal shoe, the wide toe box minimal is a zero, X-E-R-O. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about stretching before and after a run? I know there's benefits, but I seem to be lazy about doing it. But I also know the, the older I get, it's more important. Uh, well, maybe I'll start with the first part and, and maybe like what type and, and why to do it. So really, when you think about the purpose of stretching, stretching really is to keep promoting movement around the joints to keep uh, length of your skeletal muscle and your connective tissue, especially tendon. So keeping things nice and limber. Now there's two kinds of stretching you can do. There's dynamic and there's static. And what we mean by dynamic, it's movement while you're stretching. So it's generally considered safe to go ahead and do more dynamic types of stretching and flexibility before a run, and then doing the static type of holds after a run. So there's some science to say that maybe doing long, hard static stretching before might be a little bit more uncomfortable or make performance worse. The bottom line is, is that the purpose of doing a dynamic stretching also gets your blood flowing, gets your body temperature up a little bit, allows for better movement of the joints and the tissues. So we would just recommend some dynamic things before and doing the static holds after. 
after the run. Um, stretching can be done every day if you want it. Unfortunately, it's a thing that most runners kind of put to last. <laughs> it's usually running first, strength second maybe, and then stretching somewhere off in the distance. <laughs> but think of just the dynamic part, especially is just gearing up as part of the run. Just make it part of the program. Okay. Um, could you go over a few uh, beginning runner kind of tips? Um, I had several questions that came in about diet. I had several questions about just how to even start a program or how to, how to get myself on track and start the right way so I can keep going for longer. Um, Marsha, are you able to, depending on the people who are responding in, if we have materials and we give them to you, how could they get distributed? Yeah, if you if you have anything you want sent out, I can I'm gonna send a follow-up email thanking people for okay. coming and I'll okay. send those materials in that. Okay. We do have a starting program if you're interested and you're just getting going, how to get the process going safely from walking to running, so that within about four months you could be capable of doing a 5k program with minimal risk of injury. That's something we have available if you would like that. Um Prevention tips, we could also provide that. Also, uh, um, I guess maybe use of pain as a moderator for running your, your tips of. Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, having the handout is helpful because a lot of the tips are in there. The one thing that I would caution people is if you're not used to running because it's an impact, getting into a running program is slower than you think. They'll get ideas of, I'm going to go run a mile or I'm gonna go run three miles a couple days a week, it's already you're doing too much impact for your body to accommodate to. So I, I think what I would say is you gotta do a lot of conditioning and getting your body ready, just like anything else. And you, the ability to run, like I said, everybody knows how to run, but running for exercise is different. So the progression is slower than you think. So I think the probably the most useful thing if people were interested in is to send out the attachment that we developed about how to start and initiate safely a running program because all the tips are kind of laid out in there if people would like to know. Okay, so we went from the very beginning entry level runners to some people who had some very specific questions, but I got a couple of them. Uh, people sure. know that they have uh, different leg uh, lengths or different heights or issues that affect their hips that make them longer or shorter. And um, how, how can they get over that? How can they accommodate that? Or how do they approach that? So leg length discrepancy, the first thing you have to figure out is, is it a true leg length discrepancy or not? So a true one is you physically have one leg longer than the other. That's much more rare than something that's more functional. So do you have a pelvic tilt, a pelvic rotation? Do you have weakness around a muscle group? Do you, instead of run straight, do you circumduct the leg so it ends up functionally looking shorter? Or, or do you really have a segment that's longer? Do you have a scoliotic curve? So the first thing I try to go through is, do you actually have one that's longer? Because a lot of people say, I've been told, but then you go to measure it, they don't, or it's not significant enough. Then the second thing you have to ask is, well, if it is different, how different is it? Because if it's within like less than about, if it's like half an inch or so, or a couple centimeters, it's not enough for us to correct, or you do a little bit of a light correction with like almost a thin piece of cork uh, in there that, or just something that gives a light lift. So we have to be very careful that we're only correcting about a quarter of the difference to maybe a half of it and see how people do. Because once you start making big changes to something somebody's used to, you shift the mechanics sometimes to a way you don't like. So we go through a little bit of a process looking at functional leg length discrepancies, true leg length discrepancies, or is it related to some sort of rotation or muscle issue that we can change the balance of? Essentially, which if you have one that's longer than the other and it's not really that much to correct, a little bit of correction, we play a little bit like Dr. Heather was talking about with the gait and the stride length because you can mask it a little bit by, by working with the person on optimizing the gait that they do have and decreasing the forces and, and making sure they're going through in a healthy way. So a leg length discrepancy is commonly not thought of, but is pretty straightforward how to address it once you figure out where it's coming from. Dr. Heather? Yeah, and I was going to say just that, that it's Unfortunately, we, we can't change anatomy, but we can sure change the support around the anatomy. So just making sure that for those who are asking questions about the leg length, if you don't have symptoms or anything at this point or any pain, you're probably doing just fine. But if something's bothering you and you think it might be related to that, we're happy to take a look, come on in, and we can, we can kind of do the full assessment from there to figure out what's, what's going on and how it's changing the motion. We had one uh, really elite distance runner and she could tell 
about the leg length discrepancy, we put a lift of an eighth of an inch, and we use cork because it wears really well, put an eighth of an inch of cork, she ran and said, this feels great, and, we, and she never came back. So it was almost like that princess in a piece. She knew to that fine detail, that little bit that would help, but those are easy corrections to make if it's within a certain distance. Um, we had a couple questions that came in about um, I my foot falls asleep when I run. Is is that a common thing? What should I do? How do I? So when somebody says their foot falls asleep, the important thing is, did they say where on their foot it falls asleep, Marcia? Because there's two common areas that are really easy fixes. Um, do they, anybody say where? I can give you, or I can just give examples. Well, the questions, they rearrange on the screen. Okay. <laughs> so minutes, let so. me give you, I'll give you two circumstances that are common. My foot falls asleep. If it's the top of your foot that falls asleep, almost invariably, and I'm still waiting after all these years to have it, somebody that's not, they tie their shoelaces too tight. On the curve of your ankle is a big nerve coming through. If you cinch your, your laces really tight there, you compress that nerve. And if your foot's getting far behind you before push-ups and is really flexed, you really are cranking that nerve. The top of your foot falls asleep. Number two, halfway down your foot, if you're towards your, on the side where your big toe is, you're going to feel a little bump. There's a nerve there. And if you've got any hypertrophy or a high arch or you feel that bump is prominent and your laces are tight there or there's compression there, then the, everything after that on your foot is going to go numb on that side. So again, it's a shoe too, it's a lace too tight. The last place is if you have a lot of your, your cadence is slow, your stride length is long, and you really get pushed back far before push off, and you really push off hard and your toes really bend, or you have a narrow four foot shoe that's bringing your feet to a point, you're gonna compress the inter, interdigital nerves around the front of your foot. If anybody remembers the old Stairmasters when you were pushing up and down on the pedals, the front of your foot would go asleep. That's what you're doing. You're compressing the interdigital nerves between your toes and the front of your foot goes asleep. So I hear my foot falls asleep. If it's on the bottom of your foot, it's a different type of a nerve compression. That's called jogger's foot. Invariably in that group, it's right on the side of the inner part of your foot. You have a rigid orthotic or an orthotic with a plastic piece. It's pushing into the nerves right around as you're, they're coming around the bottom of your foot and it's making your forefoot go to sleep on the bottom. So there are reasons like radiculopathy and other nerve, but I will tell you, the overwhelming majority are my shoes too tight at the top, my shoes too tight in the middle, my shoes too tight in the foot, or I got an orthotic pushing into the side, making the bottom go to sleep. So those are the reasons most of the runners, their foot falls asleep. It's related most of the time to their shoes and their orthotic. Okay, I think that'll cover it. Um, someone said, I've read for uh, training programs, it says um, you shouldn't start a training program if you haven't done it before. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm supposed to be running a marathon in September. I've not, never done any strength training, but I know it's important. Should I still do it? I've got several questions came about strength training. So strength training is always going to be important. It, you're, if you want to be a good runner, you need to be a strong runner, and that's going to be the foundation you build everything on. From a training program perspective, there's a lot of couch to whatever distance. I will tell you that the majority of, ha of marathon training programs anticipate that you're running 20 to 25 miles a week for at least three months prior to initiating the program. So the best thing to do is if you, you start at distances that are within your realm and build your way up. Uh, if you're going to try the marathon type of a distance, you're likely going to be doing a run walk. Those are one of the things you're gonna plan. If you haven't been running, you need to plan a year out. Uh, other than that, you're running the risk of, of injury. Not it's a guarantee you'll be injured, but it, it'll, you need to think about that it might be an injury. Uh, generally, you're gonna plan your half marathons about six months out. So if it's between now and September, which is five months away, it all depends on how much running you'll be doing, but uh, the, the odds are against if you're training, I didn't know if the person's not training at all. If you're not training and you want to run a marathon in September, you're probably going to get hurt. If you're training for a marathon already, but you're not doing strength training, it's never too late to start incorporating it. That's going to help you with injury protection as you go forward. So I'm not sure how, if I answered the question correctly based on what they were saying. Okay. I got a couple of questions that came in about breathing. Is there any certain sort of um, breathing or breath work that you think will help with endurance or to, to be a better runner? 
scientifically, no. Uh, breathing is kind of all over the map. There's inhale with the right foot, exhale with the left foot, two breaths in and one long breath out. Uh, there is a plethora of breathing techniques and you can read about it in multiple magazines. Scientifically, the answer is whatever you're breathing and makes, and makes it comfortable. Uh, and it, even the, the best runners will have, this is how I do it. Most of it comes down to the effort you're putting in and your ability to, you'll hear that, can I have a conversation while I'm running is a pace that's comfortable. That's not a competition level pace. But if I could, if I'm going to give people advice on how to exactly breathe, uh, everybody seems to be different and the science doesn't help me one way or the other. Yeah, and I, I would actually agree with that, that it's, it's almost, it's in a way like cadence. Everybody has a slight adjustment to how they perform and what's most efficient for them. So based on who you are, your age, your body size, your height, all of you have different size lungs, different lung mechanics, different muscle setups. So I think each of you is going to find, you're going to gravitate toward what feels most comfortable for you. And whatever is most comfortable is the most efficient and costs less energy. So if that feels good to you, stick with it. Yeah, I know a lot of people do the two in, one out. So it's like yeah. in, in, out, in, in, out, in. And so I've even read stuff about alternating which foot you land on changes your breathing mechanics. And, but there's no data one way or the other. Yeah. It's a lot to think about. Uh, I got a couple of questions that came in about um, stress fractures and how could I avoid shin splints? I don't know if they're related or not, but. So what's the, is there a question about any particular question about stress fractures or just stress fractures in general? Oh, not moved. Um, hold on. It's okay. I can always do general. I would say a lot of the advice that we gave today is gonna be a really strong foundation for that. So, mm -hmm. Marcia, you find it or you want me just to kind of go I, in general? I, it, it was a, they had, one person said they had a stress fracture in their, their foot and they were trying to avoid getting that again. And then another person asked about shin splints. I thought maybe. Okay. Might be so I want you to think about two things. The injuries like that are going to come from abrupt transitions, ramping up too quickly, changing your gait too quickly, changing your shoes, route, mileage, whatever it might be. Some sort of transition occurs or you just have those mechanics that are putting too much force. Where the, the stress fracture is, is really related to things about force dissipation. But I wanna, I'm gonna bring something that Marsha brought up. Let's take in your tibia, a stress fracture versus a shin splint. A lot of people, they have shin splints, but by the time they get to me, the most of them have stress fractures. So think about pain this way. If you have, if you warm up and you have a little bit of pain at the beginning, and then it kind of goes away, but never comes back, that's usually a shin splint. It's on the front medial or inside part of your tibia. If you have pain that's at, at the end of a run or after a run that starts to get progressively earlier during the run till it's almost there all the time, but it starts at the end and it's getting earlier, most of the time that's a stress fracture. The risk factors for a shin splint are the same risk factors for a stress fracture. But if you get to the point where you notice it used to hurt at the beginning and then would go away and then it started hurting at the end and now it hurts all the time, you converted a shin splint to a stress fracture. If you're walking around during the day and you notice your foot, your tibia is aching, you likely have a stress fracture. If you're sitting there at night after walking around or you go for a run and you're in your house and your, your leg kind of throbs and aches or it wakes you up from sleep, you're just sitting there doing nothing, you probably have a stress fracture. So we will fool ourselves into saying shin splint or muscle strain because it allows us to keep running, but most of the people end up with a stress fracture. So listen to that symptom, but it also, what you're gonna notice, if it's getting worse over time, it's probably a stress fracture. The other thing I'm gonna tell you is, it takes about six to eight weeks for a bone to heal. A common mistake that runners will make, my tibia hurts, it sounded like a stress fracture. I took a couple of weeks off, the pain went away, and then I started running and the pain came back. When the pain is getting better, it's healing, but it hasn't healed. So you shouldn't be impacting for six or eight weeks. If you start saying, I rested three to four weeks, pain was gone, started running, pain came back, you start doing this. I feel better, pain goes away, I run, and then it hurts again. Take a couple of weeks off and it gets better, and then I run again. Uh, you're just incompletely healing the stress fractures over and over again. So there's a little bit of general stuff on stress fractures. 
Okay, so we're wrapping up here. Last question, and it kind of is a good way to end things. So okay. we've, we've talked tonight about running medicine, and, and I know that Dr. Kevin Vincent has a running medicine clinic, and I know that Dr. Heather Vincent has her sports medicine performance center. So someone asked a question. If I have an injury, excuse me, if I don't have an injury and I want to come visit you guys um, and, and get an evaluation, will insurance cover that? And or how do I decide where I want to go? So I'll jump in and I'm going to answer it this way. If you don't have an injury, but you want to come learn about healthy running and optimize your gait, you're going to start with Dr. Heather in the performance lab. Uh, that, because you're a healthy adult without a neuromuscular injury, is not going to be covered by insurance. Depending on where you go in the United States, there are variable prices. Dr. Heather, to allow the, it to be more accessible to the community, has kept the prices pretty low. Right now, they're about $270 to $300, and it's a two-hour session. Uh, a lot of places were $450, $500, but we wanted it more accessible. If you have an injury or had an injury and want to make sure, should I be running? Should I not? How do I heal it? Do I need therapy? What would the therapist do? And there's something related around discomfort or pain. That's when you start with me and my visit, depending on your insurance company, is typically covered by insurance. The gait analysis part with Dr. Heather won't be the clinical evaluation with me will be how to start comes down to an injury or not an injury history. No injury. Start with Dr. Heather. Uh, old injury that's healed, but now you want to make sure your gait is OK. Go to Dr. Heather. Something is actively bothering you and you want to know what it is, how to settle it down, start with me. Does that, does that help? That's, that's great. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Anything you guys want to add or anything that we didn't cover that you... I, I just want to take a moment and thank all the 150 people that are still with us tonight, giving up their evening to come talk with us. Um, we're, we're blessed. I thank you very much. And I hope that we can provide more educational sessions for you and with you. Uh, let us know what topics you want to learn more about with respect to running medicine. We will try to be very responsive to that. I would echo that. I think that you might have anticipated or learned that this is our labor of love and we love talking about this, doing this and bringing all this to the community. So uh, please let us know if you want us back and if there's anything you'd like us to talk about. And I truly appreciate people spending their time with us tonight. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you, Marshall. Bye. Thank you, Marshall. Bye.